influence upstream at the end of the pipe in the mixing zone and then significantly downstream. Uh, so we're currently doing that in both the Big and Lynn Rivers um, and uh, Dedrick as well in Port Rowan. So we've got some great data to contribute to this project and this is going to fit in nicely with some of that. It just, it doesn't go far enough into the watershed um, to really be meaningful, but it does speak to the impacts that we're currently having on our receiving streams. Great, thank you for that. Okay, I guess we're going to deal with the, the uh, what's on the agenda on page six and Mr. Uh, here. Is that it? Don't we want to go through the report? Or have we gone through the report? Well, according to the clerk, we, had, we hadn't? Okay. Let's talk about the deputation first. We got, we're getting into this when we should not have gotten into this. So all those in favor of the deputation and information. Okay, moving on to the report. So let's deal with the report. And I don't know if there's anything else you want to add, Mr. Fields? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to add a few extra things. Um, as I mentioned before, we have been meeting with Alice off and on since September. Um, I think the question was asked, was I interested or in favor of this project going forward? And I certainly am. Uh, one of the things that my position has allowed me to do over the last couple of years is sit on the International Joint Commission, the Lake Erie Annex 4 group, uh, working with nutrients and nutrient impacts on Lake Erie. Um, I have a tremendous interest in that because it affects not only the wastewater facilities and our discharging to the lakes and rivers, it also impacts the drinking water intakes. Uh, as you've seen in the news in the last several years, algae impacts on the western basin have been a significant concern for municipal drinking water intakes. Um, and it is something that uh, we constantly monitor here in Norfolk as well. Uh, Next week, actually, this dovetails nicely with a uh, consultation meeting that I will be attending on behalf of Norfolk. The, the agencies involved uh, as part of this action plan, it's in the report on page two of the report, which is, bear with me for a second, I think it's page seven of the agenda. Uh, it lists the, the names of the different agencies that are involved in federally and provincially. So they're going to be conducting a municipal engagement consultation session up in uh, Ingersoll next week. And some of the things that they're looking for is actions that municipalities can undertake to participate in ways and measures of controlling nutrients going into the receiving streams. Um, as you can see in the staff report, the end of the pipe, the municipal wastewater systems only contribute between 10 and 15% of the total phosphorus loads going into Lake Erie. So we could take our treatment systems down to zero and really have no negligible effect on Lake Erie. It's a bigger issue than the end of the pipe. It has to be looked at from a watershed perspective and that's what this report's going to do. It's gonna look at our pipes, it's gonna look at the stormwater systems, it's gonna look at the urban impacts, it's gonna look at agricultural loads and it's going to look at everything in a holistic approach and give us that watershed view of what's going on. Um, and it's a good watershed system because a lot of the nutrient loads that are going into Lake Erie, um, you know, the Thames River and some of the western ones, and especially some on the south side of the lake, they're big, complicated watersheds. The Lynn River and the Big Creek are probably a lot more manageable in terms of trying to figure out where all the loads are coming from. And because we are a small portion we are being a little bit overlooked at the federal and provincial level we're not the big smoking gun when it comes to nutrients going into Lake Erie so we think that we have a good position to go forward to the federal government and say put your money here do the research do the modeling come up with something that works that's measurable and tangible and then hopefully repeatable across all of southwestern Ontario and with that uh, hopefully answer any questions you might have Councillor Black Chairman, I have no questions and would like to move the report and speak to it, if that's all right. Go ahead. And uh, certainly, um, I support this. Uh, the Alice, I remember when it first came to Conservation Authority some years ago. I think it's a fantastic idea, a fantastic concept. And uh, um, I think Mayor Luke is, or yourself, I guess, Mr. Chairman, is, has uh, pointed uh, 
to Mr. Galvesi. Brian has really been uh, one heck of a, an ambassador for not just Norfolk County, but as you indicated, all of, of Canada. And I totally agree. Um, I think he's helped put us and from the farming community on the map and to be proactive in identifying these problems and bringing forward solutions and working with Norfolk County uh, and uh, Mr. Fields' department. And I agree with what Mr. Fields has said that we need to look at this as, as a bigger picture. You know, the whole watershed, how, how it all interacts, and we do need that uh, important data. And even in the, the report in the attachment, uh, uh, just to, to read one of the, the items in here, uh, flood and drought mi mitigation offered through wetlands, riparian buffers, tree planting, and modified agriculture will indirectly affect the cost of water treatment and other built infrastructure by reducing the need of treated water and the wear and tear on water, wastewater and storm water structures. If we can do that, everybody's going to benefit from uh, this um, undertaking. So I wholeheartedly support the farm community in, in cooperation with Norfolk County and our, our uh, wonderful staff uh, uh, represented here today by Mr. Fields. Councilor Wells. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I will be supporting the recommendation, but my question relates to the recommendation, and uh, I would like an explanation of this. And further, that Council exempt the project from the quotation and tendering procedures for goods and services. I wondered why that's necessary. Thank you, through the chairman. Uh, the exemption is required because the county is accepting the funds and facilitating the, the project, although they will be doing the project and the tendering themselves. The optics don't look good for the county because we're receiving the money. So it's uh, in a, a, a cautionary uh, exemption for council to make sure that we do have the exemption in place and we're not doing the tendering for the work. Councilor Hyde. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a couple more questions for uh, Mr. Fields. You mentioned that you could take the point sources down to zero, yet they're sitting at 10 to 15 percent. So what's stopping you? Go ahead. Through the chair, um, what's stopping us? <coughs> sorry, what's stopping us is trying to run that chemical balance in the wastewater plants. If we drive the phosphorus down to zero, throughout the process it starts to suffer because the biology that breaks down the wastewater has to have phosphorus available as part of the, the, the breakdown process. If we go down to zero, then we run the risk of ammonia going up, and obviously ammonia coming out in the effluent water is severely toxic to fish. So we're constantly playing with a, a battle of too much phosphorus, not enough phosphorus, and then if we get down to zero, then it becomes a major issue. Like the, the plant in your ward, our current phosphorus limit is 0.07. Uh, when we met with the international group, the Americans thought it was a typo. They didn't think anybody was going that low. And they said, there's somebody in the north side of Lake Erie that has got a typo. And we said, no, that's the real number. That's what we're heading down to in Ontario. And they were, they were really surprised. Um, we could go to zero, but it, it would drive up the cost astronomically. We would have to put additional works in. And we have been having conversations with the Ministry of the Environment. And, we're hopeful in the next few weeks we're going to have a senior ranking uh, official out from the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change to tour some of our facilities to look at where the right spot belongs. Um, they're talking a 40% reduction in Lake Erie for phosphorus. The three most recent upgrades, Simcoe, Dalhai, and Port Dover, saw reductions of 80, 90, 95%. So in Ontario, we're already going above and beyond, and we're saying to them, the end of the pipe may not be the best solution. Sure, we can get there. It just costs a heck of a lot of money. Maybe some of that money could be better spent upstream or places within the watershed where we can get a lot more phosphorus for a lot less money. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Bob. Uh, one of the concerns I've talked to some farmers about this is that the farmers in Norfolk County are going to get painted by the same brush that, say, Chatham Camp farmers or west of here where more of the loading is coming from if at the conservation ontario meeting it showed where a lot of the loading was and it wasn't from this side of the lake because the west of the lake has the problem and they're very concerned that they're going to have serious regulations and, and problems with their fertilizer 
So uh, I'm sure that Alice will help that if they can add a buffer to it. But have you heard anything on things like that, on regulations coming down to on them? Through the chair, um, I haven't seen or heard a lot on the agricultural side. It's honestly, it's not my expertise. But speaking to the tonnages um, that we're currently looking at managing in Lake Erie, um, back in the 60s, I have the numbers here, back in the 60s, we were running around 28,000 metric tons of phosphorus in Lake Erie. The changes to the, to the phosphorus and detergents and things like that dropped it to around 10,000 metric tons per year in the 90s. Um, in dry years, we're seeing less than 6,000 metric tons. Um, Port, or sorry, Big Creek, the numbers they have, and these, and you'll have to forgive me, some of these are, it's dated data, because we don't have most recent data. 2003 to 2013, Big Creek contributed 19 metric tons. And the Lynn River contributed only five metric tons. So we're very small in terms of the contribution loads to Lake Erie, but it, what makes that, what makes it, a good opportunity is it's manageable. We can look for things within that, and if we can get those numbers lower, it just provides further evidence for other jurisdictions to follow suit and, and get their numbers down as well. And Alice is, is the perfect vehicle for doing this. It's not nearly as threatening or as intimidating as dealing with other levels of government when it comes to establishing best management practices or other landscape um, features. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor Black has moved that staff report PW 17-29, Agricultural Green Infrastructure, sorry. Mike, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, question to Bob here. <clears throat> On, in the attachment to the report by Alice Canada, it talks about the Lehman Dam Reservoir and two groundwater wells <clears throat> that, are, that are part of this watershed, the Big Creek watershed. So, Bob, can you tell us uh, this Lehman Dam Reservoir how much water, drinking water, are we taking out of that, or any kind of water, I guess? And when are we going to decommission that and go to the third well? Through the chair, uh, it's, that project is currently active. We are in the process of developing the RFP for the, uh, the, con the consolidated services for the design of the facility. We have the permit to take water. We satisfied the ministry's requirements for the seven-day test. The permit has been issued, so the only thing we're waiting on right now is getting an RFP on the market, hiring a consultant, designing the new facility. Once that facility is underway, we'll be looking at decommissioning the, uh, the Delhi water treatment plant. And to answer the first part of your question, less than 10% uh, of Delhi's total flow comes from that surface water facility. Okay, thank you for that. Anything else? Okay, let's try this again. That staff report PW 17-29, Agricultural Green Infrastructure Application, Alice, Norfolk County, be received as information. And the Public Works and Environmental Services Department be directed to work with Alice Canada to develop and, subtain, and submit an application to Municipal Climate Innovation Funding administered by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to obtain funding for the Agricultural Green Infrastructure Project, Norfolk County involvement will limit, will limit, will be limited to provide an in-kind service and further that council exempt this project from the quotation and tendering procedure for goods and services outlined in section four of the county, Norfolk County purchasing policy EBS-02. All those in favor? That is carried. Thank you very much. Our next deputation is Mr. John Valley. You have 10 minutes, sir. Thank you very much. I do have a couple of handouts if uh, council wouldn't mind just passing these around. Not a problem. They could be. <laughs> <laughs> Checks. Okay. I got some. So I got one coming here, okay? Cheers. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of Council. Uh, I am here tonight on behalf of my clients, Mark and Kent Dixon, who are the ROI group, and they are the developers of a subdivision that you, we have, uh, that I've handed out a, a plan of here. We are here tonight to talk about the staff report that's before you regarding the closing of McCool Street in Waterford. And uh, just a little bit of background here. Uh, my clients made an application to Norfolk County Council uh, back in April, a year ago, for uh, subdivision, draft plan of subdivision approval and to, and to close McCool Street. We're hoping that the application for subdivision comes before you uh, next month. Um, but in preparation for that, we're trying to deal with the road closure of McCool Street. McCool Street is an existing municipal road allowance that runs through the subdivision. And it's, so today it's just a grassed field. It's not, there's no improvements there. There's no servicing except for a very small little piece of water main. What I've on my handout, the area that I've highlighted in yellow is the portion of McCool Street that we're proposing to close. And the area that I've highlighted in green are the proposed streets that we'll be asking you for draft plan of subdivision. So what we're considering here with McCool Street closing is more of a land swap situation. We're looking at this as basically McCool Street, the yellow again, simply being more realigned into configuration with the green, which is what the subdivision proposed layout is. So we're looking at, at this, that we, the county and the developer could, should consider this a land swap. Under the proposal, the developer would buy McCool Street from the county, then the developer would go ahead and install services, sewer, water, road, all the electrical, street lighting, all those things, and then at plan registration, the developer would give the road back to the municipality. It seems a little odd to us that we would buy land from the municipality to then turn around and give it back to the municipality. We're struggling a little bit with that. We understand the policy that generally, that generally goes along with buying road allowances that are being closed and you have a, a standard fee, $1.25 a square foot, and that's what the staff report is based on and it follows your standard policy and so on. But we just don't think that this is a normal circumstance where we're buying um, a road allowance for use other than basically handing it back to the municipality. In this case, the developer would pay Norfolk County $37,500 to buy the land, to buy that yellow strip, and then give you back the green strip. And we just, we're struggling with that. Really what we're just trying to do is realign McCool Street from its old configuration in yellow to the new configuration in green. And again, we're looking at that as a, more of a land swap. We have no problem, the developer has no problem whatsoever paying for the surveying costs and all those things that would need to be done to facilitate this. It's this $37,000 that just is sort of a bit of a burr under the saddle. Your staff report says, and a quote right out of the report, conveyance of this property will have no impact on the needs of the municipality and will have no adverse impact on the surrounding lands. It's land that you don't use for anything today, it's surplus and so on. And again, we're gonna maybe have to buy this land from you only to give it back to the municipality. If there's no need for the municipality to own this, if there's no impact on the needs of the municipality, and if the developer is going to turn around and just give it back to you, it begs the question, is it really fair that we have to buy it from you? So what we're asking and what we're proposing that you do is proceed with the closing of McCool Street as Lydia Harrison's outlined to you in her report that's before you tonight. Proceed with that. We'll pay for the serving. We'll do all those things that are mentioned there. But we're asking you to waive the charge of the $37,500 recognizing that this is a unique situation, that we're asking you to close some road allowance so that we can realign it and then give it back to you. That is simply our, our one request, is to be exempted from that fee. So I'm here to ask or take any questions that you may have. Councillor Black. 
Mr. Chairman, I got another idea. Uh, since you wouldn't be able to uh, move forward with this subdivision and make all kinds of money, why don't we swap you the yellow for maybe two vacant building lots? <laughs> that would be more than the uh, okay one one <laughs> one building lot. Then did you want a building lot? <laughs> but isn't isn't the uh, isn't the Green Street? I mean that's normal procedure. How can you link? The fact that every subdivision gives back their roads to the municipality. That's a required thing under whatever, I don't know, the Planning Act or whatever it is. So you're trying to link the two together that they're a swap. And that's why, you know, I, being a little bit funny maybe, but uh, it, it doesn't seem to, to link up. You know, you cannot proceed with this subdivision unless you have ownership of that and we're willing to give it to you. So. The developer's going to make all kinds of money by only giving us $37,000. So what do you have to say about that, Mr. Valley? Well, what, again, what I would say is that it does seem peculiar to us to buy land from someone only to then give it back. Okay, thank you. Councillor or Mayor Luke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's unique because I've never had anyone ask this question before, I don't think. I'm trying to recall. A couple of questions. Mr. Valley, on this map, I count at least six lots that part of the lot is made up from property that the county owns. I'm looking at 94, 93, 92, 91, 44, 45. And I'm not sure, it looks almost like, I don't know what the block D is exactly, but it seems to me that it's not all road, some of it makes, finishes up to make some complete, complete the lots. I think that's a fair statement. Yep, it, it certainly is a fair statement that some of the yellow is on the lots and some of the yellow is what will be road allowance. There's obviously other road allowance that's green that's outside the yellow. Oh yes, the um, most of it, yes. The other piece to, to note that in the report it talks about services on McCool Street and um, I don't know how I can reference this to you but near the right hand end of the yellow you'll see below it and there's a, there's a block there that's called B. Block B, B yeah. and it comes up to McCool Street and then uh, just north of that just uh, near where it says Street A there, it says existing easement to be abandoned. So up Block B and across McCool Street and then up through that easement and all the way up to Charles Street, the county now has the trunk water main that comes in from the uh, well field to the west. Okay. And as part of the requirement, since we're, since we're uh, not going to be owning that piece of McCool Street anymore, is that the county has asked us to re remove and replace all of that water main from the west limit of the project through Block B across McCool Street, up the easement and up to Charles Street, to rip that all out and replace it with brand new water main that aligns with the new road. So these are the kind of sort of trade-offs and so on that happen with the subdivision as it's being developed and, and discussed with, the st with your staff. Okay, thank you. And the other question, Mr. Chair, is this, and I, I don't, necessarily agree that if this land in yellow here is not conveyed to the developer that the subdivision wouldn't proceed it maybe have to be most of it reconfigured but if this council is not interested in selling this if we're not interested in selling or giving this or whatever terms we come up with to the developer I would think it would have quite an impact on on a fairly large chunk of property to the west of this uh, this road allowance. Isn't that a fair statement? There's quite a few lots. Of, looks like they're good sized lots too along there on the west side of this property. I mean, we don't have to sell it to the developer. No, if the county chose not to sell it to the developer, yes. then the developer would have to adjust his road pattern so that the green roads aligned with the yellow. Exactly, parallel beside it, yes. It would they would have to be one over top of the other. And then the, the land that is already yellow, which is already road allowance, yes. would just be incorporated into the, into the plan of subdivision. Okay. And, and yes, you're right, there'd be a little bit there at the north end that would still remain road allowance mm -hmm. owned by the county and would be somewhat okay. useless. But 
The development could certainly go ahead. The, the green roads would just have to be realigned to match the yellow. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilor Columbus, height and Brunton. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this uh, subdivision here, it, where, where would the parkland be going? Uh, and would it be a park dollars in lieu of parkland, or is it? Uh, are you designating a park in this development? No, there's uh, there's no park. The staff has advised that they were cash and lieu. So it'll be cash and lieu. What, what amount would that be? Uh, uh, you've just passed a new bylaw regarding that, and I believe the process is that we go and get an appraisal of the value of the land the day before it was draft plan approved, and then the developer uh, pays, I believe it's 5% of that appraised value. Okay, thank you. Councillor Height. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to the deputation. It appears here on the map that you've provided us that Charles Street was actually at some point in time meant to meet up with McCool Street so that there was another outlet in the subdivision. There, there's over 100 houses here and you only have one road. Isn't that going to be traffic intense by not having that outlet off to the west? So Charles Street, I, I would agree with you. At one time I think there was intention that Charles Street would have continued uh, westerly towards the bottom of the page. Is that what you're referring to? I'm sorry. Okay, well, okay, hang on. I got, yep, Charles Street, Westerly, yes. And McCool would have continued northbound to outlet onto another road. Because right now on Waterford, you're going to have an awful lot of traffic hitting one road, and they can only go left and right. So we've reviewed this, this situation with your public works staff. Uh, they have been intently involved in our design of this subdivision. We've come up with a number of road patterns that have been bounced back and forth. The challenge with extending uh, Charles Street westerly is that the, we do not own the land that would be required to extend Charles Street. There's a block of land in there that's not owned and um, the street is, a normal street is 20 meters wide and there's only a block of, I think it's, I don't know exactly, but say 12 meters that's owned and the other eight meters is owned by others who aren't willing to sell. So it's not possible for us to extend Charles Street. Um, the idea of extending sort of a McCool Street extension southerly was also talked about at one time. Uh, we actually commissioned a traffic report for that and immediately west of where that would come out to uh, Thompson Road, there is a bridge, above, a bridge there, which is part of the trail network now. And the traffic consultants felt that the bridge and the abutments there created sight line problems and they weren't willing to allow an intersection in that area which is why the that that entrance was deleted so the single entrance off Charles Street became the the only solution and the traffic study approved that yes okay thank you Councillor Brunton thank you Mr. Chairman uh, through you to John John um, first of all can you hit me with a Water main the county's asking you to do again. Where is that on the plan or where where is it proposed to be abandoned? Okay, so um, hmm, Kind of different well, pointer if you see down near the bottom, there's a big box and it says draft plan of subdivision Yep, okay right above the D in draft plan if you go straight up There's a, a, a yep. blo block B right so the water main currently comes up block B Right. It goes across the yellow section of McCool Street. Yep. It then turns to the right and goes southerly uh, a very short distance, and then it goes uh, straight up the page or easterly across the green area, the street A, and then you'll see their existing easement to be abandoned. Do you see that? Yep. yep. That's where the water main goes, and it continues on, and, and that's in an easement. That's not land the municipality owns, it's in an easement, and then it just continues on down Charles Street. So the municipality has asked that they don't want their water main in an easement anymore, they want it on a road allowance. Okay. I so we're, we're going up Block B onto the Street A, we're then t taking it uh, as, a, as a large trunk diameter down Street A, wrapping around and coming back out to Charles and reconnecting so that that long stretch of water main that's currently on easement unowned by the municipality will all be now, after this development is finished, will all be 
new water main on land owned by the municipality. Okay, well, um, the other thing I noticed on here, this phase one in red? Yes. Well, you show a block as block A as a park. You said it's cash and loo, but there is a park? Uh, that, that was our hope, to have that as park. Staff right. won't accept that as park. Um, so that will be all addressed in the subdivision report. That's lands that we'll likely give to the municipality, that they can build a walking trail or have her, uh, preservation of woodlot and so on, but they won't accept that as a usable park. It's a, it is a, a wooded area that has a stream in it and so on, and, and they're looking for cash and loo. So we're, giving, we're gonna give that land, but we'll get no credit for it. Well, I'm sure you and your wisdom, John, have looked at different layouts here, but I, I kind of look at it as, there's a whole raft of lots, 90, sorry, 82 right through to 94 that you're gonna benefit from if you purchase at uh, McCool Street, right? I mean, uh, if somebody else owned it, you'd be paying a lot more money possibly. Correct? Then po possibly. Yeah. If, if the municipality didn't sell it to us, we'd just realign our road so that we didn't have to buy it. But then you might lose a lot of the uh, lots 82 through 96. Is that possible? At the bottom there? No, they'd all still be there. They'd just be on the, on the west side of McCool Street. We might, lose, uh, we might lose a lot or two in around area of lot 45 and 44, but the balance would be the same. Well, you're e are you either going to be on uh, the east or the west side of McCool if you realign, are you not? Yes. So would you, would you still have the depth in those lots? Doesn't look like in it. In which lots, I'm sorry? Well, 82 through to 94. If you came on the, I'll call it the west side of McCool, you say you realign it, you wouldn't have the depth on a lot of them, would you? If we realign the green road, which is what our subdivision road, yeah. to align with... Oh, I see what you're saying. You're looking up in the area of lot, say, 94. Yeah, if you come around onto the, I'll call it the west side of McCool. Yep. You still got to cross it, but I mean. Yep. So at the south end at 94, those lots are over 40 meters deep okay. in that area. So if we lost a bit of depth, we would still be able to provide a building, uh, building envelope that would be suitable. Okay, thank you. Further? <clears throat> Sonnenberg, Councillor Sonnenberg. Thank you. Um, this seems like an awful lot of lots exiting onto Charles Street. Charles Street is going to be a zoo. I understand that McCool cannot go down to Thompson because of where the overpass and the, uh, the dip in the road is. That would just make a poor intersection. We've known that for years. Has any consideration been given, instead of having a cul-de-sac up here to the, to the south, extending that street to Thompson to help with the traffic flow? Or is that too close to the bridge as well? I believe the concern with extending that is that we're going, we would then be going through this ravine, which is very deep, and there'd be, I'll make up a number, 40 feet of fill needed to be put in there, and it's through a water course, and there's all kinds of heritage, environmental uh, sensitive areas there that would be a, a challenge, for sure. Um, I don't want to get too much into the layout and design of the subdivision. We're hoping to come back in May <laughs> to have that discussion when we actually have a subdivision application in front of you. We've been waiting a year for that meeting and no one's more anxious to have the discussion than I am. But uh, I, at that time we can explain to you the traffic reports that have been done and so on. Fine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. We need someone to move the the deputation. Councillor Brunton. All those in favor? That is carried. Now we are going to staff report. Just hang on a second here. I need to find my paperwork. Thirty page thirty five. Staff report E B yeah, it's EBS. Seventeen dash twenty six. Proposed closure and sale of part of McCool Street unopened. Plan 97 B Waterford. Who's got this one? Okay, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Valley has presented new information that was not previously outlined in the original request and letter that Corporate Support Services has on file. 
from his office. Uh, staff respectfully requests that the report be deferred until this new information presented can be reviewed and appropriate options be presented to Council. Lydia Harrison is with me tonight and if there are any immediate questions we can try to answer those questions but staff is recommending deferral. Mayor Luke. I'd like to move that this report be deferred. I think that's uh, a good, good approach here. Councillor Columbus. Yes, I was prepared to do that too, but I do have a question. The yellow part, um, marked in yellow on this map here, does McCool Street go north uh, further over and ab above, and it's an unopened road allowance, but does it eventually hook up to another street that could supply a different egress and egress into the sub subdivision? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Columbus, McCool Street does uh, travel north and it does intersect, intersect with a street to the north being West Church Street. Um, the majority of it is untraveled, although there are other lots that are um, abutting to that section of McCool Street as well. Well, I think it would be appropriate to, there might be a concern later on down the road with the density of the subdivision and only one point of egress on Charles Street and maybe we should or maybe Mr. Valley and his <coughs> um, clients should be looking at an egress point in the northwest corner extending uh, McCool Street to the north to the street that uh, Lydia had mentioned okay Deferral? Mr. Chair? I guess the question is going to be for how long do you want the deferral? Mr. That's Chair, I suggest one month. One month? Is that okay with uh, staff? Thank you. Okay. Well, if we put that into the uh, motion, we please. Thank do. you. Councillor Height. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just for clarification, maybe planning could answer this. Like, when we build subdivisions out like this, do we not recommend roads? Like, the municipality has the means to expropriate property and build roads that would be the required roads. Th this whole spot here could be a subdivision and there will be one or two roads out. That's mayhem. Uh, through the chair, uh, do, uh, generally it's the developer that comes forward with, uh, with their conceptual plan based on the number of lots they wish to develop, the road orientation and so on. Uh, all good developers such as Mr. Valley and uh, the clients, they, they want to maximize the number of lots and uh, although through the circulation process with staff, these are exactly the things that we would pick off working with our fire and uh, EMS, you know, uh, operations. We don't want a whole bunch of cul-de-sacs for winter control. We look at all these different things. So, uh, we, you know, we'll be part of this moving forward to uh, make sure that we can get a really good effective subdivision. So that means that, like a developer would be required to create an arterial road? like. I'm sure at one point in time all of our concessions weren't done by developers. The municipality bit the bullet and put those roads through, allowing development. So if you ask developers, we're going to have all these little short roads and there's going to be no arterial roads. In this particular case, there's development or constraints all around it, so we try to do the best we can uh, with the developer. Um, but generally, it, that is uh, their prerogative to come up with a plan to present to staff for our review and comment and ultimately for council's approval. Um, whether that means an arterial road is part of a lar larger development, uh, you know, we would certainly look at that. We would have um, transportation master plans that might have a conceptual layout <coughs> the way we'd seen in large developments like Dover Coast uh, that may change somewhat but, you know, are generally configured that way. Uh, that would be all part of our planning, our official plan and our, uh, our development review process. Okay, thank you. Councilor Sonnenberg. Thank you. Further to this, I would uh, recommend to staff that they, they, they come up with a, some alternatives. All this traffic exiting onto Charles eventually ends up on Washington. And Washington goes right by a school. We're going to have all, hundreds and hundreds of cars traveling past this school on a daily basis. This is not a good plan. I'm sorry. Thank you. Further? Okay, there's a, a motion on the floor and I'll have the uh, clerk read it. 
We'll go from there. Through the chair, moved by Mayor Luke that the report be referred back to staff for a period of one month to allow re for review of new information. No other questions? All those in favor? That is carried. Moving on to page 40, <clears throat> staff report. PW 17-26, Sanitary Sewer Flushing and CCTV Inspection, 2017-2020. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Public Works Environmental Services put out a tender for Sanitary Sewer Flushing and CCTV Inspection. It's basically a four-year contract. Uh, we had... 16 companies take out the documents, eight responses were received. Um, we've checked the references for Sewer Technologies Incorporated and we're prepared to uh, move forward with them for this project and uh, look forward to getting started. And with that, I'll answer any questions you have. Councillor Wells, Councillor Brown. Much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I couldn't help but uh, be impressed when I looked at the difference in pricing from the from the lowest bidder to the highest one, there's a difference of $18.16. Wow. That, uh, oftentimes we don't appreciate uh, tendering, but here's a case where it worked in our favor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilor Brunton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you to Bob. Bob, uh, they say this is good for four years, eh, this contract. So you're telling me in 2020, they're gonna do, uh, Per lineal meter at 1440. Is that correct? The way I read it. Through the uh, through the chair, that that is what the pricing uh, per lineal meter worked out to based on the submissions. That's four years hence. It was a four-year contract. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So in four years, they're going to there's no inflationary cost in there at all. Through the chair, not that I'm aware of. No. Okay, and uh, so uh, we've budgeted 200000 for 2017, and we have no idea what we're going to budget for the next three years hence, right? Through the chair to Councillor Brunton, we've maintained that we'll continue to budget the 200000 in our operating budget. The, based on the total kilometers in Norfolk County with our urban infrastructure, that will allow us to have some contingency. So if we find uh, problem areas where there's breaks or defects, we do have contingency to go in and open up the road to make those repairs. This company also provides a whole suite of in situ treatments. So they can pipeline, they can spot repair, they can do all that stuff. And we've been provided pricing uh, on the repairs for those as well. So if we need to, we do have some money available for that. So. Do they do relining? Through the chair, they do all sorts of uh, sewer rehabilitations. They do lining, they do inserts, they do lateral inserts, they do the whole thing. So, But that, that's not included in the 1440, is it? Or is that, that I assume, is included in the 200,000? I'm a little confused on what the 1440 is. Is that just for inspection TV? Through the chair, the 1440 per linear meter is to flush the main and then come in with the camera, video it as per the industry standards, provide us with a video inspection report with all the notifications and notices on them, and then submit that to us. Any repairs that are required because of the video inspection will be ours, and it'll be our choice whether we use them or we do it with our own forces or we schedule for a later date. Uh, it's not part of this, this submission. So it's not part of the 200,000? Through the chair, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Well, sir, <clears throat> go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Public Works, uh, at this contract, it will only do 13.8 kilometers per, ye per year, and you have 225 to do. So are you just looking at certain areas like the poor infrastructure in Port Dover and such? <laughs> because you're going to be decades doing this at this rate. 
through the chair, we'll, we'll prioritize where the areas with the oldest infrastructure is. There's no sense of us paying a contractor to go in and inspect a brand new subdivision. So we'll be focusing our efforts on the older infrastructure until we get caught up. And how many kilometers until you get caught up? That's what I'm looking for. Through the chair, I'd have to run the math on it. I haven't looked at it that closely to see where it takes us out. But the idea is that we're going to build up our inspection program so that we get it all covered off within a within a reasonable time frame. Uh, we're, we've got a bit of a backlog on the last few years. We've been a little uh, slow getting out to some of the areas, but we're hoping to pick up some traction here now. So, How are they being inspected now? Through the chair, uh, it, we've been inspecting them based on problem areas, no one, no one historical problem areas that we've had problems with. Uh, blockages or any kind of defects so we've been hitting those as a priority and this is going to look at the entire collection system so through the chair to, to Bob do you send our guys out or do you call a contractor out to inspect it currently we've been doing most of the flushing um, with our own forces but if we have to video we've been bringing in just single contracts at a time but this is to, to award it on a on a whole system-wide basis where they're going to come in and spend days and weeks within Norfolk doing the work. Okay, so we've been doing this service, we just haven't tendered it out, so is there a, a cost savings or... There, there was, I'm hoping so, or did you just come up with 200000 mm -hmm. Through the chair, several years ago we, we went through a similar blitz where we went out and inspected all the sanitary laterals but it's been some time since we had a full program. Uh, when, when Lee Robinson came in, that was one of the first things she did is looked at what current service we had with this video inspection. And she put that line item in the budget last year. We didn't get an RFP put together in time to start last fall, but we did this year. So we're in the process of getting that caught up. Um, this, is, this was budgeted above and beyond what our current operating budget was, so this was an add-on during the last budgeting session. Okay, and don't we have a video toll charge for customers now in our user fees? Through the chair, that video fee is for the sanitary laterals, the smaller pipes coming out of the homes. We have our own video inspection for that, the small diameter pipes, so those are typically five inches in diameter. The pipes that we're going to be inspecting with this company are anywhere from eight inches upwards of 24 inches. So it takes a very uh, robust robotic system with the pan and tilt camera. So they'll get to each individual lateral and then be able to turn the camera and then shoot up into the laterals to look at all the different types of pipe fittings and joints. So this is a, a far more sophisticated system than the little push rod cameras that we have. This would be a full CCTV truck with a couple people and a crew and a flusher truck working out in front of them to get the pipe prepared for inspection. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mayor Luke. Thank you very much, and Robert, uh, thank you for this report. Bob, um, two questions. The first one is simple. When this camera work is completed in 2020, what would be the time lapse until we have to go through this process again? Roughly, every 10 years, five years, 20. So this is an easy question or is it This coming? is an easy oh. question. In, in your professional opinion, what's the estimate? What do we do this how often? We're hoping that we can keep this on an annual basis because as we get through the, the high priority areas, the key, the key infrastructure areas, we're going to start to look at some of the newer subdivisions that have come on because we want to make sure that there's no defects in any of that installation, that there's no additional water coming in from some pump connections and things like that. So okay. uh, we see this as a project that's going to stay current and it's going to stay in our operating budget. Um, it's also part of our due diligence program. Uh, if we have any kind of backups or any kind of major claims, the first thing the insurance adjuster wants to see is any kind of video records that we have for the main, any kind of evidence we have for inspections. And uh, we do manhole inspections. We'll pop the manhole, make sure the flows are going, make sure there's no obstructions. But that just is at those access points. 
this is inside the pipe. So this gives us the evidence if we are in court, this, this becomes our due diligence. Okay, I got my answer there that this probably isn't going to go away after four years. The other question I have is when I look at the bidders, and Robert, I don't know if you want to comment or not, but when I look through that list of bids, eight of them, like that 1440 just stands out like a sore thumb. Like it's almost like the one should have been a two. When I take the 1440 out from sewer technologies, <clears throat> excuse me, the other seven average $27 per linear meter. And here we've got one that's like just out on its own. Have we had work done by sewer technology Technologies Inc. My thought is we we haven't. Bob, do you know if we have? Please through the chair. Through the chair, uh, we have not worked with Sewer Technologies. Uh, we did do, do the reference checks, and everything came back satisfactory. Okay. We do have checks and balances in the process that if we are not satisfied, good, we're done. Mr. Chair, uh, I certainly um, Bob Fields knows his business, and I respect his his opinion. Um, Bob knows all about this business, so um, if he's comfortable, then uh, this maybe is a huge savings. I don't know. If it isn't a huge, huge savings, it might be a typo here. <laughs> I don't know. It just struck me kind of funny looking through those tenders. Anyhow, if Robert says, thy will be done, it will be okay. Thank you. Right, Robert? <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Councillor Columbus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bob, we currently have a, a flushing truck, right? That's used by our staff. Through the chair, that is correct. We have a, a flusher vacuum truck that we use for emergencies, but also part of our own flushing regime. Uh, we try and target about 20% of our urban infrastructure with it, but we also share it with the roads division. So they use it for catch basins and their 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 system as well. So it is uh, a very prized piece of infrastructure, and it's something that is used on a daily basis. And I believe it is up for replacement. I think in it's either 2018 or 2019 because it is. Uh, I think it is getting towards the end of its life cycle, and it is a very key piece of equipment for us. And will will this truck be relieved of some of its duties and the staff? because we're going into this contract? Uh, through the chair, no. We will continue on with our uh, work. We're going to continue on in areas that the contractor is not. So uh, we will definitely stay out of each other's way, but it'll give us our opportunity. It's important that our operators get a chance to be on this equipment. They stay familiar with it, stay current with it, and by setting up those programs, we're able to do a lot more than what we currently were in the past. And where is this company, Sewer Technologies, from? Through the chair, uh, this company is located in Port, Port Perry. Port, Port Perry, on the side of Toronto. Okay. In the future, can we get a list of where these bidders are from? Would that would it take much time to add that as a column? Uh, through the chair, I think I'd have to get direction from SLT as to that. There, there are some conditions that have to be part of this bidder's uh, summary. It's uh, detailed in the purchasing policy, so I'm not sure I'd have to get direction from the, the uh, EBS folks and possibly SLT on that. Like I'm just saying, if, if it's sewer technologies, if, if you could just put Port Perry behind it or London, Ontario, or wherever they're from. Sorry? Hmm? You want it? Okay, go ahead. Through the chair, there are a large number of legal ramifications to doing that, none of which are justifiable under the current common law. Uh, we're not allowed to discriminate based on place of origin, be that Canada, the US, or Mexico. It's a rule under NAFTA. Uh, so having the information implies that you're going to use the information. Accordingly, I would strongly endorse not, not receiving the information, going with as is, and not seeing location of origin uh, so that we can't get in trouble that way. <laughs> Councilman Brunton. Uh, Mr. Chairman, do you have a motion? Not yet. I'll move the report and i just make a comment that if things work out, uh, 
with this contractor, maybe we could save buying a new truck and just use this company to flush our culverts and catch basins and everything. Forget buying a new truck. It's an idea. Eh? Anyways, I'll move the report. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Seeing no other hands, Councilor Brunt has moved that staff report PW 17 26, award of contract PW ES 17 01, sanitary sewer system flushing and CTV inspection 2017 to 2020 be received as information and that the con and that contract PWES 17-01 for the sanitary sewer system flushing and CTV inspection contract be awarded to Sewer Technologies Inc for the price set out in report PW17-26 and further that the mayor and clerk manager of council services to be authorized to execute the contract documents. Anything further? If not, all those in favor? That is carried. Moving on to the next one, which will be page 43, staff report PW17-30, recycling containment budget. Man, the budget amendment. Who's got that one? You as well? Yeah, okay, but go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so council directed staff to report back at the January 31st uh, Council and Committee meeting to look at ways to reduce recycled material being blown out of recycled containers and to also look at a possible pilot project. So Public Works and Environmental Services staff have looked at essentially four options. The status quo, which would basically be things as normal with a bit of additional advertisement. Um, increase our promotion education to really push the message home to folks that putting recyclables out when it's 70k wins is probably not going to work out in your favor so we would be working within our established budget for 2017 and maybe look at a small budget increase for 2018. third option was to look at increased bylaw enforcement which we would have to work with mr baird's department uh, to look at bylaw enforcement to hold strict to the set out requirements and the fourth option was the pilot project um, we think it would take around three months to conduct it to be a meaningful pilot. Um, one of the concerns that we've heard from other municipalities is that it does add to the contractor's costs if they have to stand there and take off the lids or the mesh, uh, fight with them in the frozen weather and things like that. So we'd want to get input from the contractor as well. Um, and if we do have a successful pilot, uh, some of the costs that we're seeing for some of the nets or slotted lids or anywhere between $200,000 and $500,000. Uh, looking at those options, uh, staff still feel belie believe that the most effective or the most cost effective option would be to stay status quo and put a little bit more effort and promotion into um, preparing the material for collection, deal with public outreach on that. However, if council wishes to proceed with purchasing additional equipment, then staff uh, recommend that a pilot project be initiated to determine the effectiveness and the efficiency of, and the acceptance of any lids or nets. And with that, uh, hopefully answer any questions. Okay, Councilor Black, Councilor Brunton, Councilor Wells is it first. Go ahead, Councilor Black. Uh, well, Council certainly, Wells. it's, it's um, I'm the one that put this motion, notice a motion on the floor, and uh, I appreciate staff coming back with this report. Uh, it's always a shocker when uh, you look at the, the amount of money and time and effort to to do something. But the, these these complaints have come from not just myself, my own observations, but many many other people out there that uh, bring this to my attention. But uh, um, if if we don't do the pilot project, at the very least, uh, I think we should be doing the. The education and and I guess Bob through the chair to uh, to you Bob the recommendation here is just for is it to option uh, four the pilot project option is that what the recommendation is it doesn't include um, two and three like the inc increased promotion education and increased by law enforcement or does it through the chair, uh, staff felt that they needed to provide at least an option for council to, to debate. Um, I think we're open to pretty much anything that council wishes to direct us on this issue. Um, 
if we were to go forward with the pilot project, we'd be bringing back a further report to, to inform council how the pilot went. And from that, there would be a series of recommendations to, to implement a solution, to do some ed additional education and outreach. So it would be a pretty encompassing report at that point once okay. we finish the pilot. But staff at this point feel that the best option is to, like you, like you commented, is just to work on the education and outreach work with the public to make sure that it's put out in an appropriate fashion in a timely manner and not uh, too early and not during major storm events.